Thank you. Um, call to order. Roll call, please. Donahue. Here. McKnight. Here. Roa. Here. Vogel. Here. Stearns. Here. Um, if you're able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you have a cell phone, iPad, iWatch, if you don't mind muting it, I will try to remind you to turn the cell phone on after our meeting. Katie, uh, if you could give us the uh, meeting notice, please. Uh, executive session was held on January 6, 2020 to meet with legal counsel. Motion to approve the minutes. Motion. Second. A second. Any discussion? Roll call. Donahue? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Roa? Aye. Vogel? Aye. Stearns? Aye. Andy, do we have anyone signed up for? Um, uh, technically, no, Your Honor, because both individuals are actually on the agenda and will present tonight, so. Okay. Uh, communications. Katie, if you would read the communications, please. Your Honor, I have a letter of resignation dated December 22nd, 2019 from Dan Hunter. I have recent, been recently promoted at my place of everyday employment and didn't know what to expect with my work schedule. I will no longer be available on the designated meeting days. After a couple of years, I've done a small amount of good and have helped an incredible forward-thinking authority board. It is with a sad heart I resign from this great board. My hope is that the space can be filled quickly with another talented volunteer. Yeah, thank you. Um, someone would like to make a motion to approve the resignation? So moved. Second? I second. Thank you. Um, we want to thank uh, Dan for the time and effort that he put in at the Market House. I know he was pretty much involved with them. And, and like with all of our volunteers, we appreciate their time and effort. So, anybody else have any comments you'd like to make? Roll call. Donahue? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Roa? Aye. Vogel? Aye. Stearns? Aye. And then you have another letter? Your Honor, I have a letter of interest uh, from Paula Burley dated November 10th, 2019. I read out of interest in a position on the Meadville Market Authority. I relocated from New York, New York to Meadville just over one year ago for a visiting assistant professor and gallery director position in the Allegheny College Art Department. And I have been grateful to have the Meadville Market House as a resource for fresh and local food and ingredients, many of which are difficult to source elsewhere in the area. I am thrilled to see the expansion of the Market House with the Mobile Market House, providing access to healthy whole foods to an even wider audience. I am passionate about food and cooking, and I believe that large-scale agricultural and big-box grocery stores have alienated us from feeling connected to what we eat. Thus, I seek to foster a relationship with local farmers and producers in order to learn more about where my food comes from, the treatment of farm animals, and the use of chemicals or pesticides in farming practice. As an educator, I find it gratifying to help others become invested in food and its sources and to find joy in its preparation. Through events like the Farm to Table Dinner and the cooking lessons offered by Zest Kitchen and Guest Chefs, the Market House offers opportunities for people to learn and connect with one another over healthy, locally sourced food. I would be excited to think about how to expand this type of community building and educational programming. Likewise, I would be interested in collaborating with current Market Authority board members to think about ways to sustainably diverse, sustainably diversify the Market House's offerings and relationships with local farmers and purveyors in order to provide even more products to local residents. Through my work as director of the Allegheny Art Galleries, I've been thinking deeply about how to use social media, print, and web-based platforms to promote events among the Meadville and not just Allegheny community, as well as how to expand an audience to reach those who might not be familiar with art. I could apply what I've learned to the Market House to strengthen what is already an important center for community engagement. As my role at Allegheny is currently shifting from visiting to permanent, I look forward to investing time and energy in a place that I am excited to call home. I would be delighted to meet in person for an interview to discuss the position. Thank you in advance for your consideration. Okay. Um, did we forward that letter to the <clears throat> authority? I believe it came from them initially. 
Um, no, it came directly from Ms. Burley. I think they were aware, so it, it took some time to receive Dan Hunter's resignation to confirm that, and she had sent her letter of interest before we had confirmation of Dan's resignation, so that's why it was dated November 10th, and we've we've held on to it. I had communicated with Ms. Burley telling her that we were, would need to confirm the, the resignation. So I, I suspect the market authority is aware, but I, I have not directly communicated with the authority as a body. <clears throat> when we, we're working, not we, but we're looking at um, a process where we uh, have more of a, a standard way of appointing individuals. I, I, I think I've met met her once. Um, I think it was actually when our visitor from France was here, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I don't know her personally, her background. Um, I've never met her. Sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah it sounds that's interesting. interesting. Sounds like she has so, a lot to offer. I don't know. I mean, there's no need for act, council to act no. on tonight. In fact, I mean, you can do that under appointments, but at this point, it's just accepting your letter as of interest under communication. Council can decide at any time when they want to make, when and if they want to make an appointment. How's council's feeling? Let's go forward with the appointment thing we're working on, and then this afterwards. Uh, would that would that be true for for all appointments that we would hold off then? I guess I'd want to I see. I don't know if there's anybody else in right now. Oh. Well, we've got another one on the another letter on the agenda. On the agenda. Um, I guess I would either want to see us vote on on all of them, um, or or decide to hold off on on all appointments until. I would um, distinguish between the two. We know Mr. Taglia. Have known him for years. We know how he thinks, we know his work ethic. I have no problem with acting on an appointment for him tonight. I have not met this person, I would like to at least meet them, and then I would be comfortable. I don't think that you have to have a long, involved process. Um, well, I'm gonna flip back because we don't have a policy in place. Um, I don't know if the authority has met with her and, and, and spoke with her. So we didn't we did not get a recommendation from the authority then? Uh, no, that's not my recollection, right? <clears throat> I mean if we're I mean if we're looking specifically, you know, at, at Paula, like I have worked with her on a grant review committee. Um, I, I think she's intelligent and thoughtful and um, I think she would be well suited for the position. I, but again, I would want it to be a standard. Either we vote on all of the uh, appointments that are pres presented to us, um, or or we or we hold off until we do adopt a, a policy. I uh, her word for is good enough for me. So I mean, I mean, I don't know when I'm going to get a chance to be a doctor anyway. Here, here, here. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> sorry. I would like to meet with her, but from what I've heard of her and what her recommendation, she sounds like a good candidate, but I think in fairness to, if we're going to follow a procedure, we need to do that. If we're going to set a procedure, I think we should follow it. Then on the other hand, Mr. Battaglia has been involved with the city, you know, I mean, so it's kind of a six, one, half dozen, the other. I think he'd do a good job. I think he fits well, but again, if we're going to set a procedure, I think we need to, to stay with it. Well, we haven't set a procedure yet, yeah, that's the so issue. we can vote on on both of them tonight if council's comfortable. I'm comfortable, to be honest, um, from her record, from what I've heard of her and what she has to offer, <coughs> from what Mr. Bertagli has already, to his service that he's given the city and his knowledge, I, I feel that we... we Let's you know. go on to John, the other one. Again. Well, we can do them individually. Um, if, if we want to make the appointment for Paula, I need a motion. I will, I will so move. Second? Second. Any other discussion with Paula's? Roll call. Donahue? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Roa? Aye. Vogel? Aye. Stearns? Aye. Great. Okay. Uh, you want to go ahead and read the next one? Uh, Your Honor, I have a letter of interest from John Battaglia dated January 9th, 2020. I am interested in filling the vacancy on Zoning Hearing Board and have conveyed my interest to council members. Motion. So moved. Second. Aye. Second. Um, discussion. Um, so, John, you're here with us tonight. So, 
the quandary is you are on one now, and oh. we're about to point you to a second one, but you can only hold the one. I hadn't, I hadn't anticipated that, but I would have to leave the planning commission. Okay. Gary, can we do that with him, or does he have to resign first? He would, if, he, if the vote uh, is in favor of appointing him, him to a zoning hearing board, he would then have to immediately submit his resignation from that board. Okay. And for the public's benefit, the Municipal Planning Code mm -hmm. um, requires that zoning hearing board, zoning hearing board, <coughs> zoning hearing board members cannot serve in any elected or appointed position any elsewhere in the city. So he would not be able to serve on the planning commission. Okay. Any questions? Any discussion? I would just, um, I mean, looking at the, you know, I recognize, you know, your longtime service, John, and, and so appreciate it. And, um, but I would, you know, just uh, looking for me at, at the kind of stark contrast between between the two letters. Uh, to me, you know, I think a one sentence letter of, of interest is, is uh, uh, points to me to, to a, a needed standard process by, by which we appoint folks, which I know we'll, we'll look at later. Um, but uh, I, I guess I would not necessarily be comfortable moving just on, on the letter of interest that we have here in front of us. Okay. Any other discussion? Roll call. Tahi? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Roa? Aye. Vogel? No. Stearns? Aye. Okay, so let's go down through. Oh, we have more. You have, you have three more communications. <laughs> 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 Uh, Your Honor, I have a letter from Women's Services dated December 5th, 2019. Uh, Dear Sir, Madam, encloses a check for $200 from Women's Services Incorporated. This is a donation for the city police and fire departments. Thank you for your assistance. If you have any questions, please contact me. I'm going to sign Melanie Reynolds, Fiscal Coordinator. Okay. We want to thank them. Um, it's very nice for the donation. Um, go ahead with the second the next one, uh, Your Honor, I have a letter from the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development dated January 8th, 2020. On behalf of Governor Tom Wolf, it is my pleasure to inform you that the Department of Community and Economic Development has approved a grant in the amount of $64,800. These funds are provided through the Department's Strategic Management Planning Program and will be used for the development and impl implementation of a five-year financial management plan. Your project enhances Governor Wolf, Wolf's efforts to revitalize and grow communities in Pennsylvania. Uh, it goes on to detail what the next steps in that program are. Okay, thank you. And then, letter go. Um, I have a letter dated December 4th, 2019 from the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Thank you for applying for this year's request for proposals for Western Pennsylvania Conservancy's Canoe Access Development Fund. We are pleased to inform you that your proposal for a project on French Creek's Kenneth A. Beers Bicentennial Park boat launch in Crawford County, PA has been approved for funding from WPC's grant program in the amount of $4,000. And again, it goes on to detail the next steps. Great. That's good news. Glad to hear that. I mean, glad to hear all, all of them, but that one especially. I like that. Um, Manager report, Andy. Uh, Your Honor, there's, uh, I've got a number of things to report to Council, but um, there are two presentations on this evening's agenda. One is by the Arch of Crawford County, Mr. Mark Weindorf is here, along with um, still professor, semi-retired perhaps, uh, professor of art at Allegheny College, Mara Geffen, who's been involved in lots of public art related projects in town. Um, long interested. I've partnered her with her going back to my days at the Redevelopment Authority on Mill Run related um, interpretations of, of public art and whatnot. Um, and the ARC is here to discuss um, their recent grant award. There was a press announcement and event earlier, <coughs> class, it was, time flies, um, uh, funding they've received from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, which has a new pilot grant program called the Creative Communities Initiative. Um, and Council, you can provide some of the information. I'll let, I'll let Mark and I assume Amara sort of discuss the project. Um, but this was a very competitive grant funding. Over 105 proposals, I think, were received by uh, Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, which resulted in field interviews. We met last summer or fall with someone from the PCA group of, from Meadville. Um, and so they're here to talk about the project and the next steps. Mark? Thank you, Your Honor, members of Council. Um, we're excited about this opportunity. As you know, we purchased the Meadville Club 
with the hopes of making it a viable green space in downtown Meadville that could be used for our individuals who have intellectual disabilities and, and so they can foster natural relationships with community members. Um, and we want to tie into some of the great things that are going on. You have the summer concert series, which happens outside our back door. And currently we're supplying them power by running an extension cord out of our back door. You know, it, it's great, but we're hoping to maybe move that over to that site and build the stage in the years. So we were one of 105 people that applied. Um, 15 people got to submit a letter of interest, or actually submit, and then eight got site visits. Uh, Andy and Mary Ann and some other community members met with us. We walked around town. It uh, certainly didn't hurt that Amara had all her artwork to show and display and all the years of service she has done to this community. And uh, they were very, very excited about our project. Um, so going forward, we'll have $100,000 from them. It'll be about $250,000 with in-kind services, money $5,000 a year from Marquette Savings Bank. Um, we're working with Ashton Porter, who's done some work for us. He approximated to be about $267,000 to do the project. As you're familiar, Mill Run runs under that. We probably won't get into that yet, but it's our hope that daylight parts of Mill Run through this. So in the first year of the project, we hope to get some electric run over there and just get it graded off and seeded and be able to use it and find out what uses work, what uses don't work, and then year two kind of go on that. We'll work with the community to find out what interest they have in this. We also uh, worked with Second Saturday. We had a table to get some interest in this. Amara has another project, which she can probably talk about with the Snodgrass building that's gonna kind of beautify that. Uh, we've talked with some other landlords to help beautify their project properties as we do this project. So as a result of this, it would take the city's uh, requirement to have $1,250 a year for four years to get that match. And out of that, we'll get at least $260,000 of the project started. Uh, Mara has been working so hard that I can't keep up with her on applying for other grants. Um, so we're working with the city on those as well. And we're very, very excited about what will happen. You know, we can have all kinds of things. I think it's beneficial for Second Saturday. We have a uh, very active downtown business community, which is doing events, and we can also utilize that space for that. So it doesn't always have to be people with intellectual disabilities. As long as we're including them, we'll be very happy. Oftentimes today, our folks are still sheltered, and we want to get them from not being sheltered and being viable members of the community. So when they go to the gym, when they go to church, when they go to the grocery store, they see somebody, and somebody speaks to them, and they're a person, and they say hi, and it's so important for us to do that. So we're really encouraged for this initiative, and, and uh, we're working hard down at the ARC to do a creative or a supportive employment program and get people out and get viable jobs, and there's a number of things we do, but this is a project that's very near and dear to our heart, and we're very blessed to have Amara, who's done all this work. Um, as you know, some of the beautiful projects she's done for the hospital, and uh, she did something with their park, and uh, so I guess I'll turn it over to Amara and let her speak. Yeah, I, not too much to add. I would just say that the um, match that's required from the city can be in kind. There's no cash outlay that has to happen. And our vision is that there will probably be, uh, the first mural we'll do will be on the Snodgrass building. And we'd like to look at the, uh, Mr. Mergancy's building, figure out what's happening to the cinema with the cinema, figure that out. And there are two other buildings, Tom Stout's building, and the back of at the bank. So the idea is to have a series of outdoor public sculptures and murals that really create a frame for that space. Um, Mark mentioned that the first year we want to grade the site and just make it usable, but the small if you've been over there, um, there's a small section that will be a green space and a larger. We're going to start with the smaller one this first year, and it will be a stormwater. It, it, uh, it will serve as stormwater from Clinton Court um, uh, from that section. Um, and then we'll leave the other half um, just graded, so that, as Mark said, so we can figure things out. And then we'll look at um, art and uh, features for to highlight Mill Run. So we see it kind of as an outdoor room, a creative hub in the heart of downtown, it's pretty unusual to have something like that. It's a great space um, to work with. It's a great canvas. <laughs> um, one of the questions I had, do you guys have it where it's on the website? Have you find, picked a final design yet? I know there were like three that you guys were choosing from. There, there is some artwork on our website if people want to go to the Ark of Crawford County. Okay. Um, 
and we do have a link on there that they can look at that but we're really not going to lock in until we get the community members at large to do this we had one very successful um, pilot initiative last year we had an outdoor movie and it was beautiful uh, the ra it rained hard and after that there was a moon that was over CJ's building and people sat and watched the movie and there was a lot of excitement in the air for this event drew a lot of community members in if it hadn't rained it would have drew a lot more, so. The beauty of this grant is that, and it's kind of unusual because usually you have to have an engineered plan, you have to be shovel ready, and the beauty of this is that we can allow this to evolve over time a little bit more intentionally so that we really meet the needs of the community that wants to use it. Right? We, as Mark said, we know we want a stage in there, we'd like there to be some storage under the stage. Um, George is George Stabile is really interested in moving his venue, the second Saturday Night Live events, and we've got theater groups that want to do events there and businesses in the downtown area that want to make use of it as well. But we, especially that one larger section, we don't really want to design that until we get through one, at least one year and see how's it going to work. We don't, we don't want to design something that prohibits what might be most beneficial in the site. Um, and we know we want to do something to highlight Mill Run and make that a feature. It's such a <coughs> visual component already that it needs to have some, you know, punch to it to make it really aesthetically um, exciting and to make it a space that people want to spend time in. I like the idea. I mean, and that's why I was asking if those pictures were anywhere where the public could come and look at them because the one that I saw with the opening of Mill Run is really cool. I mean, it. It's really going to be nice in that area. It's going to be a, a nice green place. And and parking, I, I would take it, um, parking would be available over to the um, DEP building, yes. correct? Yes, the beauty of our site is we have our own parking lot where we can move all our cars and move parking over there and have, there's ample parking around. So we're very excited about that. And I would add, uh, Mayor, that if anybody has an interest, they could contact us at the York. We're looking to make it a community uh, space so if people have thoughts like somebody told me what if we made a bench out of a zipper because town was a big thing or what if we did something that that simulates a railroad um, because of the new historical so we want to work with everybody in the community to find out what works for us we're very excited about the uh, mural that's going to go on the back of the snodgrass building that will happen this year as well and that'll really beautify that and so we're looking at all community members and, and what they see as an interest and we're open. That's the beauty of this project. The first year we'll kind of get it cleared and beautified and then we're open to hear what the community wants. So we don't want to build something that we don't need. We want to build something that we have a buy-in. And with the theater, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but it is now in an estate. Um, the owner has passed away. So it went into an estate now. So I'm not sure what's going to happen with that building at, at this point until the estate settled. But, um, and we're excited to talk to the city about that too, what's best for the city and if there's any help we can do to assist that, we'd be more than happy to. Yeah, I'm not that. quite sure. Um, I just found out about this a few days ago that he had passed away. I, I know that uh, Ashley Porter was down there and he had some very exciting plans to think that that might be a space that changes. So we look forward to working with Andy and Marianne. And Ashley. Well, we appreciate what the ARC's doing, especially for the community. And, it's really exciting to see things like that come together because when I do my traveling, I'm not sure about the rest of you, but you know that's what I look at when I travel and the, the neat little things that are just in place that you know brings people in and that's it, it helps you and it helps us. So we appreciate everything you guys are doing. Mark, do you already have permission from the abiding property owners to put the murals up? Yes, we have. We already have permission, and that will happen this year with the housing authority on the Snodgrass building, and we. Be working with CJ once that's done, I'm sure he will be amenable to it because it'll be of no cost to him or very little cost. And right now, if you're driving down, that's all just blocked. It's not there's no seal coat, there's nothing on it, it's uneven. Uh, it's very unsightly on the back of the cinema itself. So if somebody would purchase a cinema, we work with them to beautify that space. If if not, we would and will there be funds available for maintenance of these in the future? Those funds will probably be through our general budget okay. so I don't think the fund would be that significant that we couldn't utilize those annually through our budget mark one other quick question I you said uh, what's the commitment from the city this is the dollar for the picture 
2500 mark, I think, annually. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, 2500. 2500. Yep. So, Council, under new business item A on your agenda is actually a resolution that Council has asked us to support. And, um, and, and Katie can read this here in a minute, but to, to um, Amara's point, right, it's not clear yet at this point in the process so that we're committing this at the front end. It's not clear what that match looks like, whether that's in kind. Um, thinking out loud, right, that might be the city, there might be capital expenditures that the city might already expend in terms of paving Clinton Court in the future. Um, painting crosswalks, um, bridge improvements to the Clinton Court Bridge there. It could be park for, I mean, it could take the shape of anything. It could be lending a dump truck and equipment operator for an afternoon. Um, so I think, I think the sky, I think that's an open, you know, process that we'll look at to see what makes sense for the project for the city. Um, could take shape in a number of ways. Okay. Mark, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank for you for coming in. Again, thank you guys and, and <coughs> buying into the city and, and making changes. We appreciate that. So with that, Council, um, I ask your permission if we can go ahead and move number eight up. Do I have a motion for a resolution? Well, wait, I'm sorry. Let's read the resolution first. <laughs> Resolved by the Council of the City of Meadville that whereas the purpose of the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts Creative Communities Pilot Initiative is to provide multi-year funding to community-driven arts-based development projects that serve as catalysts for livability, economic development, and community connectedness. And whereas the ARC of Crawford County as lead applicant has successfully completed the application process and has been selected as one of four grantees for the Creative Communities Pilot Initiative and will receive $25,000 per year for up to four years. Now therefore be it resolved that the Council of the City of Meadville hereby supports the ARC of Crawford County's inclusion and the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts Creative Communities Pilot Initiative. Be it further resolved that the City of Meadville supports the important work of the ARC of Crawford County, as well as their participation in the Creative Communities Pilot Initiative, and pledge, pledges either in-kind services or cash contribution not to exceed $2,500 per year for four years as a local match to support the project. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Council on Comments? Sounds like a good deal to me. Me too. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it. Okay. At this point, I'm sorry. At, at this point, it would be an in-kind contribution, but there is a possibility it would be a cash contribution. I, I think there's a possibility. I mean, it's. I think your point there is not budgeted right, but um, I think that could take the shape of another capital improvements that might be required by the city anyhow in the future in that vicinity that could probably be applied towards that. That might not be a direct operating budget expense, for example. Uh, I just want to underscore and and kind of applaud the the approach that you're taking. I think it's great to kind of center the community and uh, figure out what we what we need before we throw a whole lot of money on the site. And it's a yeah. really great site to beautify. So thank you for doing all of this for the general public. Okay. Roll call. Donahue? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Roa? Aye. Vogel? Aye. Stearns? Aye. As they say in Star Trek, make it so. <laughs> Thank you. Younger ones may not get that one. They may have to watch it a few times. <clears throat> what is Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> If, if you guys want to kick okay. out, you're welcome Thank to you. do so. Thanks for coming Thank in. You. If you enjoy form-based zoning, however, you might want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go with uh, Andy. Please. Yep, so uh, the next presentation on our agenda this evening, Your Honor, uh, and Council is an update uh, from the Meadville Planning Commission. Um, a couple of members here this evening, I'll let Gary introduce them. Uh, Carolyn Yagel from Environmental Planning Design, the city's planning firm, consulting firm is here with us. Um, but Gary, I'll ask that you sort of set the stage of how we got here, when we started the process, where we're at, and then we'll turn it over to Carolyn. Sure. Uh, just real quick, the members of the Planning Commission, well, member, I should say, uh, Mitch Homan is in the back here. He's a member of the Planning Commission, been on here a few years. Um, and um, John Battaglia, who was a member for about 10 minutes. <laughs> um, thank you for your service. Uh, um, so, okay, just uh, some background. For the last, I, I want to say, just about 10 years, the Planning Commission has been working on zoning updates that are needed for the, plan, for the zoning ordinance. Uh, 1994 was the last comprehensive update to it. 
Um, we had struggled from a staff perspective to be able to really push through these updates and bring it to council for a formal review. Um, and at, following the 2013 comp plan, we tried to tried to uh, accelerate that somewhat, but um, what really spurred this to be able to come to fruition is the My Meadville project, um, community planning project, came through and um, the success of that and the state recognition of what it was able to accomplish it actually resulted in, I believe, a 2018 state planning award brought the state um, to bear and into the city and basically said, hey, we, we, we'd like to help you try to get that and some of the other recommendations out of the 2013 comp plan, get those through the process and into, into the zoning ordinance. Um, there were so, a couple uh, common themes from the 2013 update and from my Meadville, and they centered a lot around neighborhoods and trying to preserve neighborhoods, feels of neighborhoods, the feel of the city, the small town feel, um, trying to bring back the downtown a little bit more as well as special spaces that we have, such as the Diamond and the Market House and, and, our, and a general area downtown. Uh, one of the other recommendations um, or, or themes from both efforts was uh, some way to provide incentives or, or um, encouragement to property owners to under, underutilize properties. And so when we talk, take a lot of those themes together, we basically came up with, I didn't, but we could, between the state and, and the Planning Commission said, why don't we look at form-based zoning, which is a different, fundamentally different type of zoning than we've had typically, which is known generally as Euclidean, not to get into the terms, but it's, it's focused more on form than, than use, okay? And so that's, the, that's, the, 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 that's how we've been moving forward with this. And frankly, I wish I had come like a little bit sooner, maybe late summer, honestly, I would have liked to have come before council to talk about where, what head, where we're headed, but because it's such a, a shift in the way that we would do zoning, I wanted to bring it to council before we got all the way done to bring it to council. We're probably about three quarters of the way done. And so to that, to that end, for about the last year, we've been working in environmental planning design and design, Carolyn Yeagle here, and uh, she's gonna kind of go over what form-based zoning is really about so that makes your council has, is comfortable with what we're trying to do here. So. I have one handout, so um, it's brief, and I think we'll hit on some of these points and things you can take away. I also recognize that uh, one of the exhibits that Planning Commission and I had and a staff have been able to work with is something you may have received in past weeks. I'm not going to, in interest of time, go through the detail of that. If there are questions that you have following this discussion that you want to talk with Gary and if at any point we want to have a conference call or other kind of debriefing on it, I would be happy to do so. But um, for this evening, uh, I just want to take a look. There are four pages here. Thank you. And out of all human curiosities, if you can work, walk through them with me rather than um, we'll do it page by page. That will keep us all together. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Gary mentioned a number of key uh, components as it relates to these differences. There are tools within the municipalities planning code, that big book, right, that uh, allows municipalities to do the things that they can, that uh, also have some of those phrases. And we're going to be relying upon, the city will be relying upon those phrases as it looks at this kind of approach. One of those key phrases is looking at established neighborhood character. So one of the distinctions of this form-based ordinance and where Meadville is in its history is thinking about not only what development is, but how redevelopment can happen in certain places. If I can say just a few moments ago when you were talking about even the art project, there were a number of things that ultimately may tie into zoning. Buildings, uses, parking, signs or art, murals, all of those kinds of things start to fold into right the components of zoning in one form or another. But the, one of the other things that is also significant in thinking about established character is from a neighborhood perspective, what kinds and scale of structures are in different neighborhoods within the city? How are those buildings placed on a lot? How are the areas of parking that have been built today placed on a lot, right? You have buildings, you have parking, you have access, all these kinds of things. A lot of what is done in the ordinance today is based on minimum 
kinds of criteria. In some cases, where we have things going on, I'll use Park Avenue as an example, and how form comes into play, is there are some buildings that are pulled very close to the street on some of those lots. In other parts of Park Avenue, some of those buildings are pushed pretty far back. The ordinance that you are working with today has minimum setbacks. <coughs> it doesn't have something like a maximum setback. So if the, if was it Pampered Palette uh, Cafe, Bistro, right, Bistro and Cafe, were to have some sort of redevelopment, or the lot at the corner of Park and Arch, where the building is pulled right to the corner and the parking is in behind. <coughs> what this ordinance, in terms of form, would be looking at is actually, we probably don't want to lose the character of that street, right? If that building were to actually, over time, years from now, not tomorrow, but years from now, how will we want that intersection to feel? What would be the form of that intersection? Because with a minimum setback, that building could actually be pushed way back, similar to what Citizens Bank, right, is pushed way back. So we're looking at the components of character. What is here today, what has made Meadville Meadville over its history, and those points that we really want to emphasize and retain as development and redevelopment happens down the road in the future. So the element also of land use, Gary mentioned form is a driver, land use is also a driver. It's just not the first driver, like a lot of people think about zoning today. So I mentioned we'll think about scale and placement of things. Then we'll think about land use. As part of this update in some of the districts and the map that you have that we're sketching on and trying to figure out really where these lines want to be, we're in the concept of introducing mixed-use districts because by and large you actually have mixed-use districts here. We want to formally recognize those and in some cases the uh, uses that are in some of the neighborhoods are actually non-conforming. We'd like to be able to expand the use lists in some of these districts so that we can make the uses that are happening that are complementary to the neighborhoods as they function, not everything, but you know, the ones that complement those neighborhoods actually make them conforming by recognizing them as legitimate permissible uses. So bucket one, thinking about things in terms of minimums and maximums and the character and scale of places in different neighborhoods on different types of streets. Then thinking about land uses and the potential in these mixed use areas. We don't call them mixed use areas, but they function that way. So we want to think about the districts as they're defined, consolidate some of them, adjusting some of those lines to recognize things, make them a bit more conforming so people that are coming in, for whether it's development or redevelopment, have a little bit smoother of a process. We're also evaluating things uh, that were special exceptions, right? And uh, Mr. Pataglia will get to know at some point, likely, as part of that zoning hearing board, because um, zoning, those different classifications of what's permissible, what's conditional use, going in front of planning commission and you all, versus what is special exception, going in front of zoning hearing board, where we've been evaluating over a number of months how we can make some of those uses actually more permissible by right, and having that be okay, because we've, in bucket number one, looked at all of those kinds of forms, the things that are often struggled with as part of the special exception or conditional use process. So we've made a little bit more sense of, some, of that kind of uh, those sets of issues before we get to the news discussion. A lot of balance, that's what we've been doing. Um, so in terms of the, the packet, if I could have just a couple more minutes. And then, uh, so we, we have on the top uh, something as it relates to potentially where we're headed with some zoning district designations. The bottom right corner is starting to think about the kinds of districts that we would actually be working with in the future. That's a, some of our reconsiderations for introducing some mixed-use properties. 
or mixed use districts, excuse me. The second um, packet is an example sheet. It looks like this. And where a lot of the criteria in the ordinance is spread out in various chapters, right? And to come in for an application, you need to look in a lot of different places. We're going to be introducing what we're calling some quick views. This, along with a few other pages, specifically related to each individual district. So someone can look at it, just a few pages and get the gist of everything that should happen within that one particular district. They still have all the regulations, right? I mean, that would apply. But it's that quick view of what are the basic components of what I need to know about that district. So there's a lot of information organization that's also happening within this document. And then the last two, if I may, take you to, um, we'll have two pages, a B1 and a B6 that's in the top left corner, or top, excuse me, top right corner. This is the kind of way that we would like to be introducing how form works. There are definitions in the ordinance, all of those kinds of things. But we want to introduce the sets of things in terms of some illustrations because by and large, this type of presentation is a way in which both the applicant and the city staff and yourselves and anyone else that there's a universal language to this and the way in which we can then go back to those quick views, tie this type of criteria to a quick view and say, there are particular dimensions, respective of the streets that we're on and the districts that we're in and how those setbacks work, all of those kinds of, or the heights of different structures. So introducing this code to reinforce all of the character elements of what we want to uh, have you know, in the future for Meadville. Organizationally, looking at the document a bit differently so that we can make it, I'm going to say, the most user-friendly document that we can. It's two. And three, um, probably of interest both for the public and the private sector, thinking about the kinds of things that are established here from a use perspective and reinforcing those types of things so that we can bring some uh, elements of conformity to some of the things that are happening in neighborhoods today and they are operate you know sort of in that non-conforming world so those i think are the big highlights uh, the planning commission has been thinking about these concepts and uh, as we continue to evolve this with staff we're going to be back in front of them so that they can go through some of the nitty-gritty ultimately we would be seeking a recommendation from the planning commission prior to it coming back uh, to you all so that you would then be able to have it for consideration. I think I have hit the things that we needed to get in our time tonight. A couple of the quick things I want to mention, other than the fact that these two sheets are me put me out of a job, other than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone's going to have to put it on the website. <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of exciting. With some of the issues with uh, we, that we identified both in my Meadville and 2013 comp plan was that there's not a good return on investment for for developers looking to buy big single-family houses. We've got a lot of big houses in town. We've got a lot of big houses that are very expensive to operate or and potentially may not be have a highest and best use as a single-family home. And so if you look at that that use district, the, the matrix sheet, it talks about, if you look on the right side, you'll see several new proposed uses that could be in the MU1, which the MU1, mixed use one, is really what would be today be considered the R2 district, multifamily residential district. And you'll see on the, on the right side, you'll see upper floor residential, you'll see bakery, barber salon, cafe, green grocer, tailor seamstress, all these neighborhood scaled. Okay, it's not a full fledged coffee shop. You're not talking about a Tim Hortons in the middle of a residential district. You're talking about such as uh, how the how Pamford Palette used to be on the corner there. Now I believe it's East Street Eatery. Something right. small like that in the neighborhood, you could walk to, you could walk past, you could not a lot of parking, not a lot of impact on the neighborhood, but it allows those expanded types of uses that allows a neighborhood maybe a place for people in the neighborhood to hang out or see if some kind of identity in the neighborhood and it allows uses that may occupy otherwise unusable buildings when I mean, you've got some of these big buildings in town maybe it would work better as something like this in a neighborhood but it allows that it opens up the zoning so that it allows you to 
maybe explore some of those. Maybe, maybe the market's there, maybe it's not, but it allows it to happen if we can. And it also, one last thing I want to mention, let's not take up too much time, is it allows some uses from a downtown perspective. Right now, upper floor residential uses are allowed by what's called special exception. As Carolyn alluded to, they need to go to the zoning hearing board, they need to pay 300 bucks, they need to make the zoning hearing board happy that they can meet all the rules. Under this, we're talking about making it permitted by right. So that they come to me and I say, okay, well, and we, we may not even require parking for that. It may be that, you know, maybe they'll figure something out on their own and not say you have to provide this many spaces by lease and show me. It makes it a lot easier to use that upper floor residential space. And then all they have to fight with is the state building code, if that, you know, however that might apply. But the zoning gets out of the way and allows more of a use of those downtown traditionally upper floor residential <coughs> use. It really opens that up a little bit easier, makes it easier for people to do that downtown and maybe get some more people living downtown, which is one of the things we want to see. Contributes to pedestrian, yes, pedestrian and tra foot traffic to the businesses downtown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, from a form-based standpoint, opening that up, I think it, it would be really helpful for fo a lot of our goals that we want to do, both from my Meadville standpoint and from 2013 comp plan update standpoint. I would like to emphasize that component of, uh, as you saw, and Gary mentioned, a, a few things that need to be of the right scale within neighborhoods that may be non-residential. The Planning Commission over a period of several meetings actually went back and forth on what does that set scale mean, right? There are some maximum square footages or that impact not wanting to have something negative as it relates to parking or access or hours even, right? So that we can write those things as supplementary regulations and still allow the use permissible by right. So that we have uh, a lot of tie between what the elements uh, as it ultimately wants to be, you know, vitality uh, with the types of structures that are there and being able to retain those to the greatest extent to reuse those structures for things that uh, the market um, will want to have move forward. So. Well, I'm going to share with you, I like what I see. And I'll, the reason I like it is because I don't know, maybe six, seven year ago, years ago, we were talking about, and Gary knows what I'm going to say, that I'll step back a second on Prospect Street. You know, there used to be a pizzeria right at the top where the college was. Brought the neighborhood together. Yes, remember that? You went through kids? So, younger. Um, and I saw a lot of that, for an example, in Buffalo, where they had a bakery. Now, you don't have to have a, I mean, you can have a five star bakery in a small home mm -hmm. and, and, and they're very successful. I know it to be true. So years ago I said that we need to put more of these in the neighborhoods. The only thing that I was concerned about and we talked about is, is um, accessible for parking because that's one thing I found when I would go to these uh, in Buffalo that the parking wasn't, there was not enough parking. So I mean, if the food's good enough, you'll walk two blocks to get it, that's, that's right? Yes. So that would be the only thing that I want to make sure that if, if we were looking at that, that there would be especially accessibility for, for you know, handicapped parking and things like that. The component of also this mixture of or introducing these kinds of uses is not going to be in the residential, uh, single family, R1 existing neighborhoods. That is not the intent at all. So if anyone were to ask you, hey, I've heard about this mixed use, what does this mean? A coffee shop's going to go down on my block? That's not something that uh, would be in, in the mix here. It's a matter of we're looking at those strategic places where we want to start that um, type of development and the proper scale and then be able to work our way towards really the, the downtown uh, core and, and progressively increasing those opportunities. So it is um, something that parking is one of those ones where we were talking about that and what that okay. meant across the different neighborhoods. Yes. Yeah, I personally like it. I think you're going in the right, right. direction. And um, appreciate that. I think it's going to, it sounds to me, of course, everything sounds great, but I'm sure there's going to be bugs to work out, but we're making it easier for businesses to start and, and people to develop. And if, you, if you're going to expand the city, you have to make it easier. And this seems to be doing the trick. I think that was given as a decree to us, so that's what we, <laughs> what we are to do. Yeah. Thank you. Will this facilitate development with 
with less interference from, from the local government? By a matter of uh, a number of things here, both from the use standpoint, the scale uh, standpoint, and thinking about uh, minimums and maximums, that is what we seek to do, yes. It's expansion of uses, being able to fold into some of the non-conformities that are happening and make them conforming, and then providing opportunities um, in the different uh, neighborhoods for additional things to be able to happen and still respect uh, what is established. And I just recall Frank Lloyd Wright believed that form follows function, and you're basically taking the uh, converse of that, that function follows form? No, I think we're actually putting them on equal playing fields because we still have the functions of the streets. There are a number of streets, so as part of our work, we have actually categorized the different types of streets or um, the way in which the scale of those streets work. And so um, we are looking at that with the land uses, with all kinds of um, access. So we have those functional elements that we have to uh, respond to and use being a, a big one. But it's really thinking about the form component at an equal, at an equal level. And so the point about minimums and maximums that I mentioned a little bit ago, we believe it's necessary to think about some maximum kinds of setbacks on particular uh, kinds of streets or in different areas of the city because otherwise we're going to be losing the functionality of some of these um, blocks ultimately if things get set too far back or the element of uh, sort of uh, vitality or appeal, right, becomes a matter of what happens if all along Park Avenue, or significant portions of Park Avenue, a lot of those buildings were pushed back. That would completely shift some of the components of what we know of as a Meadville. So that function piece of having the relationship between where buildings are on the lot, where parking is, how the access points to the lots work, those all need um, balanced out, and we are getting at as part of this. And I think reading the handout that was given to us a couple of days ago, um, <clears throat> you're talking about shared parking as a concept? In certain uh, districts, specifically in downtown, yes. Because in a lot of the cases, the Set, well, there, there are two components to that. The one is on a number of the lots that exist today, if they were to be redeveloped and need to follow certain parameters within uh, the, the city's ordinance, they would not be able to be developed as, be redeveloped as they are currently. Because uh, things like parking ratios and whatnot would need to, would impact, right, what was happening there. So if there is something that is a shared parking agreement, and that could be something that's an option, you know, someone that it's not a necessity. If someone wants to have their own parking and satisfy that, they are more than welcome to do that. If from a standpoint of how the lots are configured, if there is some sort of alley uh, component to that, or if it's a corner lot, and sharing were to make sense. They would need to demonstrate that you know, a certain number of criteria could be fulfilled in order to have that. And there would also, of course, need to be an agreement that would then be filed with the city, because then it's upon the um, development to be able to say that they've satisfied. And they could continue over time to satisfy things. If there is a change in use over that course of development, they would need to revisit that and make sure that they could still you know, uphold what that agreement is. So there are, uh, there's a lot of then in the nitty gritty piece well beyond you know, these things. That is what Gary will have as his job, <laughs> continue to retain. Um, but no, so shared parking is a very good one. There are a number of boroughs, very successful boroughs, that do have shared parking agreements in some cases, there are public um, lots that become involved, and in some of the cases, those are private lots. So it's a, there are a and lot of different possibilities. I'm just concerned whether it would place an additional burden on the city to acquire more area for parking. I don't think it would at all, no. 
it would be a matter of uh, a choice that a lot owner could um, put into play and need to satisfy in that particular way, whether that's with you know an, an adjacent lot or some other type of agreement that is still needs to be approved by the city. I mean, it's not something they could carte blanche just to say, I want to do this. There, there would be parameters to it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I, my, my question is, where's the scope from here? Where, where do you, you presented this to us now? What's the... Well, today we, again, as I said before, I apologize. I should have come to council earlier, but I wanted to make sure the council is essentially blesses the concept, not the particulars necessarily, but blesses the concept. So from here, we'll move forward with combining this discussion along with the previous 10 years worth of uh, effort that the planning commission put in, bring it all into a, a single ordinance in the next few months, I mm -hmm. believe. Yes, this and spring. And then come back to council in the spring, hopefully, Yes. Uh, for consideration, discussion, amendment, and adoption. I'm okay with going forward, Jim. Uh, I'd like to have us get a couple drafts between now and then. Absolutely. Autumn? Yep, I'm good to move forward. I'm good. I'm good. Keep, going. Keep going. All right. We Sounds will, uh, as we share the information, we will uh, create packets for you all accordingly. And as you have questions they arise, then uh, we can coordinate on those and get things <coughs> incorporated or refined as we need to to get back to you. Great. Well, thank you for thank all you're you. doing, especially all the, the authority. I appreciate the time. time. Different. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, I do have a couple other items for you under my manager's report if you're ready. Yep, go ahead. Uh, so under Communications Council, we had a letter from DCD awarding the Strategic Management Planning <coughs> Program grant. Um, and Council is aware that we were simultaneously then seeking proposals. This is actually probably the fastest turnaround of a grant application I've ever seen in my life from DCED. Um, they were very helpful um, in doing that. So. Um, we had actually simultaneously advertised and sought proposals. Um, those proposals from consultants were due today, and we received two proposals. Um, and so we will begin to take next steps to A, review them, um, and we will schedule interviews. Um, my question to council is, I think we ought to have, when we do those interviews, Gary, is it, is it in front of full council? Do you think we do those interviews? Do we do a subcommittee of council? Do we have a council? What's your pleasure? Since there's only two two proposals, um, would you like to have a proposal from those consultants at the body of council? Um, and they would presumably then, I mean, they, we would review the scope of work. They would talk about their approach, the work they've done in other communities, the how they would uh, approach the work plan. Um, or do you want to create a subcommittee of council that would meet with staff to to review them and? Uh, I kind of think it might. The recommendation. I think it might be kind of nice that all accounts are <coughs> involved. Um, okay. in, in the beginning, because that gives you you two kind of an opportunity to. If we had eight or ten of them. I would suggest otherwise, maybe. But with the, with only two firms, that seems pretty manageable. But let's do that. Okay. okay. Jim, all right. Yeah, that's fine. Sean, that's fine. So we'll work through what that means with a consultant and how we schedule that, but. Um, uh, so to be very clear, this will be a very a new and large burden for council and staff. This will be a pretty intense project in terms of providing information, evaluating information, data, interviews, staff interviews, stakeholder interviews. Um, but we will we will get that moving and be back in touch with you. Well, having it all in front of council also makes it public. So yep, let's do that. Council is also aware when we're talking about proposals that we had sought uh, a couple of things, right? They'll, at the end of last year, council assigned our pension fund management agreements to the, the firm that bought CS McKee, who was our pension fund manager. Prior to that, we had gone out to the market to seek proposals for a new pension fund manager. Um, we were working with our pension attorney, Randy Rhodes. Um, he has vetted those proposals, has come back with three firms to recommend that we interview and, and meet with uh, for pension fund management. Um, and I guess I'll make the same request to council. We've um, The pension boards have each identified two representatives from each of the three pension boards um, that would form a committee to review those proposals and interview. 
Uh, my question is to council, is there a member of council that would like to, I know Councilman Rowe was selected as the finance committee uh, representative at the last meeting. Um, whether Councilman Rowe or Council Zabadi wants to sit on those. Um, I, I, I was not appointed to one of those, sorry. As a, on the pension board side? Yeah. I don't believe so, no. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I guess I'll ask Council if you want to do it as a group or do you want uh, Jim being the finance? You're going to bring it up. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to go anyway. So. Right. I trust I'm not you. sure what your, your I work trust schedule you. is. I trust you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. yeah. I don't know what your work schedule would be to be able to, to do that, but I'm going to give you the opportunity. I think Jim would be fine. Okay. All right. So we're just going to have Jim do it as a, as a member of the finance committee. A member of the finance. So, Jim, we'll be in touch with you. We think we're going to set up a first meeting with the pension board representatives and Randy Rhodes, our pension attorney, to review how we selected, why we selected, review the proposals themselves, and then we'll then we'll do the interview separately. But that seems to be our approach so far. We'll be in touch. Thank you. And you'll keep counsel updated. I will keep you updated. Thank you, Jim, for doing that. My pleasure. The city fared fairly well with heavy winds over the weekend, uh, but actually what we um, discovered on Monday morning, actually um, the property owners of Brookside Apartments off of North Street right along Mill Run had contacted us of uh, the major tree fall in Mill Run, um, that very large tree that brought down other tree, and this morning our public works, so to prevent future damage, um, public works removed six dump truck loads of wood from Mill Run behind Brookside Apartments. Um, we had a full two crews in there working with chainsaws and, and some equipment. Um, and so we appreciate the cooperation of Housing and Neighborhood Development Services. They're the owner and operators of the Brookside Apartments there. But uh, for public safety, we jump right on that just to make sure that that debris doesn't travel downstream and cause major clogs and culvert or bridge. Didn't hit any, areas. any of the buildings? So. No, 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 no. We have a property, we have property up there also. I'm we, sorry. Our pro we have properties. We do. Have yeah, property. further, a little further upstream. Um, there's another section downstream um, in the vicinity of Fuller Buildings property, Fuller Constructions a property that we're, we'll be monitoring as well to decide whether or not we think we need to do some clearing of the channel there as well. But it didn't seem to be as, as pressing. Um, the Meadville Area Recreation Authority and with some partners, Food for Thought, the Meadville Neighborhood Center next Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. at Second District School in the cafeteria. We'll be holding a, what they're billing as a town hall meeting, but specific to the Summer Parks program, seeking input on programming, curriculum, scheduling. Um, and so we encourage folks interested in that. Um, and so they'll seek sort of public input and feedback there and then plan to come to council with a proposal for the summer parks program. I plan on attending that and I thought, Larry, you yeah. might want to go because we're on that on the, the park committee. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, other council members can go, but at least you and I should, yeah. should go. Um, Council's aware, so we had obtained federal funding, the local federal aid route funding paving. That um, was to be portion Allegheny Street, portion of Lumber Road, um, portion of South Main around Diamond Park, and we had to delay that paving last year. We had done curb work in those sections um, in anticipation of that paving. Um, that is a PennDOT managed project, well, staff PennDOT managed, PennDOT bid project, and actually those uh, uh, bid opening is tomorrow. So we will have a sense tomorrow of the project cost, the timing, who the contractor will be. Um, but essentially, and then uh, Nathan Zazul and I also have a phone call on Friday. PennDOT is planning a significant paving. We're not sure of the timing, but um, State and Washington Street, Liberty Street to Poplar to Williamson, Spring Street, um, are all on PennDOT's near-term um, paving list. Those are all state routes within the city of Meadville. Um, so we're going to have a sort of status meeting with them on Friday to get a sense of scope and timing. Uh, and they've got some design questions for us. Um, we also, we do know what our CDBG funded paving will be this season. So long story short, all these things are coming together here very quickly. Um, and we will come back to council at a future meeting. Um, probably no sooner than the end of February, though, with what we think is the paving plan looks like for the season. We'll bring that back to council for feedback. Okay. Um, uh, we, the Zoning Hearing Board actually has a hearing tomorrow. Um, they'll be reviewing, and I, I'll maybe let Gary actually talk. This is a special exception and variance request for electronic sign on Park Avenue at the um, 
one federal credit union property on Park Avenue. I don't know if you want to speak to that very quickly, Gary. Sure. The request is for a, an electronic sign to be moved from the credit union's current location on Arch Street to the Park Avenue uh, location. Electronic signs are permitted in the city only by special exception, which require, which triggers a requirement to go to the zoning hearing board to meet several conditions. Um, one of those, there, the, one of the variance requests is to allow it at that location, which is actually in a historic district, and the electronic signs are not allowed in the historic district at all. So it requires variance for that. One of the standards that the that the board or the applicant would have to meet in order to be granted a special exception is hours of operation it allows electronic signs to be operating only during that entity's hours of operation. The credit union is going to seek a variance to allow operation of the sign outside of outside of business hours. They weren't specific as to exact hours that they'd like to have that operational, but that's a second variance. So it's actually a special exception request to allow it at all, a variance request to allow it in historic district, and a variance request to allow it to operate outside of business hours. Is that all done in one hearing? Yes, sir. Did, um, we did receive communication from a taxpayer in the city of Meadville. Uh, Denny DeBase sent yes. us, and you responded to her. I responded to her. Because her concern, if I'm not mistaken, was is this sign going to be lighting up the bedrooms and will be on? Will it be on 24/7? Will be flashing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what I'll say is the zone, the ordinance does not permit flashing or animation of any kind other than scrolling. It's allowed to scroll, and that's the only kind of movement you, you're allowed under the ordinance. They're not seeking relief from that, um, but it does have re requirements on auto dimming maximum intensity of lighting, no sound. Um, there are several requirements. I think I believe there's seven standards that need to be met. Um, so while we're on this, and I'm going to skip a few steps ahead, the Academy Theater talked to us once about the marquee, uh, the changing of the marquee that they wanted to go with a LED, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I don't think it was going to be flashing. It was going to be stand or just sit alone still. Um, so when we're doing the, the variances and things that we're going through now, is that covered in those, the new? That would have been the same request to be a special exception and a variance to allow it in a historic district, and that was denied. The Academy Theater was denied to have the electronic sign there. Because of just being electronic? Because, right. In electronic, it's not LED, it's not internally illuminated. It's electronic sign means it's essentially controlled by a computer and allowed to be manipulated by That's a historical area, correct? Right. Well, they're, they're not, they're allowed only by special exception anywhere in the city, first okay. of all. And the second is that they're not allowed in the historic district, a specific historic district downtown. And you said uh, the federal credit union is going to be in historic? Correct, correct. Or be on the edge of a historic district. So if they get approved of that and they get their sign, then what about the academy? Can they reapply? If they can always reapply, but it's not the any of there's an appeal period after zoning hearing board decision of 30 days, which you can appeal it to county court. It would not impact that case at all. I'll say that much. And I, I'm, I'm guessing that you're getting at, are they setting a precedent if they allow it? Absolutely. And what I'm, but I'm always told and what I always tell people is each case is unique. So can the academy, if they approve this lighting, can the academy reapply without going through the court system? They can apply again to seek a special exception and variance approval from the zoning hearing board for a sign. Um, that doesn't mean that it would be granted or it wouldn't be granted based on the decision of the credit regarding the credit union. Each case is unique. That's what I always tell people. It's not necessarily right. precedent. I just wonder what their, their thought. Well, and in that case, they'd have to buy a whole new sign. You know, they, they did a big fundraising campaign just to get the one that they have now. Is that, that the Academy? The Academy. Yeah. Um, but it, it's able to be lit, correct? Yeah. The if I may speak. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, we have a static sign there now. It's plexiglass. And what we had looked at was putting LED lights because we have to get up. We got up a couple weeks ago. There was ice and snow and wind. It's really dangerous to get up there with two ladders and put the panels in. The new LED sign would be static. It wouldn't be flashing. It wouldn't be rolling. We would change from show to show, but we would be able to do it inside. And our sign that we have now would accommodate the new LED panels. If the new zoning ordinance were in place today, would one federal credit union have to have the hearings on the three issues? We don't. At this moment, we haven't proposed changing that. 
Okay. The sign, so, it's like the sign provisions of the Right. So the sign provisions, most of, there's a few that changes, tweaks we would make, but I don't think anything's proposed to change that. Okay. It can, of course, but it hasn't been yet. So, because it, and I, I'm sorry, Councilman. No, okay. But the only reason I say that is because it was, those were, those specific, um, Electronic sign provisions are adopted in 17. They're fairly new provisions, so I don't know that we'd go back and look at it. We absolutely can, but we weren't thinking about it because they are so new. We weren't sure if there would be a need for a change. So is this just an update to council? Are we, is there an action that we can or uh, are presented with taking? So this is an update to council. So we, because there's been interest, we've had a couple citizens inquiries to at least two members of council have contacted me to better understand what the, um, how this works. Gary and I talked, so in general, I, this might be a question in general, if you would like me to report on a zoning hearing board action, we have notified, in the past we've notified council. Council, you should be aware that the zoning hearing board has an application in front of them for their hearing. Um, but I would be, I mean, I could, the process by which is that they need to be received by? Generally by the end of a preceding month for the right. hearing on the third Thursday of each month. So I could at future meetings, right, at the first Wednesday meeting of the month, say to council, council should be aware at the third Thursday or whatever, you know, is a zoning variance request hearing for this purpose. Um, council historically, it depends, I suppose it depends on the issue, council historically has, has taken a sort of a laissez-faire hands-off because the zoning hearing board is an independent authority um, board of, appointed by city pursuant to the MPC municipal planning code. Um, I, I don't. There is ability to appeal too. I mean, if people don't get the decision they want, they can appeal it. Mm -hmm. So that's correct. There's provisions for that. Um, there's, I suppose there. I mean, I guess council could, as a body, if they chose, to take a position and or report a position of council to the zoning hearing board to be in support of or against or um, or raise concerns or something of any particular issue in front of the zoning hearing. I suppose they could choose to do that as a body if they wanted to. And I was under the impression we can choose to do that as a body, um, or we could express it as private citizens. Individually, you could pick up the phone. Directly to yes. the zoning. Okay. What I will say is if you do have a position on it, don't contact any of the zoning hearing board members individually. Attend the hearing. Okay. Unless council wants to take a position as council, which is a separate issue. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll report that the we at the end of last year, probably the final quarter, we had talked about filing a uh, delinquent stormwater program fee, um, and we had notified those individuals uh, for all delinquent accounts for all prior billing years, um, prior to 2018 and prior. Um, at the end of the year, uh, the Schaefer Law Firm did file 109 liens um, for delinquent accounts that had not made any payments or arrangements for payment plans by, by the end of the year. Um, and so that did happen, um, and we're still receiving payments under payment plans, and we'll revisit that, I think, probably in April. Um, we'll know, I think that was um, the largest accounts had three to six months to pay, so um, we did take action to file against, file leads for those that had not made any payments or payment arrangements, payment plan arrangements. Um, and that is all I have, Your Honor, in terms of my report. Any questions for Andy, Council? Okay, um, old business discussion, market uh, authority loan. Um, this is for the second floor ceiling project. So I guess, uh, John, I'm gonna put you on the spot because John and I went down yesterday and actually crawled through the, the attic and things. So you don't mind, I'll, John? I, um, <clears throat> this is coming from my experience. Uh, I, I'm not sure what that would cost I think they're probably in the right neighborhood, but uh, it looks like the, there was some damage, and without actually removing the suspended ceiling, you can't tell what it is. But one of the issues that they have there is it's all volunteers, so you don't have much control over them to, to get them to do stuff. So uh, if, it were, if it were up to me, and it's probably up to the authority, they need to get an experienced carpenter or contractor in there knows how to take that ceiling down. See, I, it, there may not be any damage above it. It could be just that, uh, that the uh, wires that hold it up have broken, but it, it looks like 
it follows the path of, of the HVA system that was installed. So I suspect that probably years ago when they put that in, that people were walking around up there and uh, in the insulation and stuff and, and loosened up the, the plaster, from which was done 100 years ago. And some of it fell down on the ceiling, but uh, it could be a it could be a big project and it could be a, a small project. But you're not going to know without somebody taking those panels out and seeing what's going on. And I would not recommend volunteers doing that. You know, it, it looks like it, it could be dangerous. So uh, I, I'm not sure. Council owns the building, so you probably have some exposure there. To just anybody getting in there, so and, and you don't, you know, you don't have to have a big lead contractor. Just somebody that knows how to handle that stuff, and you know, has a uh, has a uh, home improvement ticket that knows how to uh, handle that stuff. But for me, I would just get somebody there that knows what they're doing and, and take that take those panels out and go from there. You know, but, and it's not like. The ceiling, if you've been down there, the ceiling that was there has been there a long time and they've had problems. They have all kind of paint on them for, to cover up uh, stains or something. And, and they probably should be updated, but you know, one area it looks like it was some sort of gallery to display art. And uh, I'm not sure what was in the other area, but uh, Leroy and I were there for an hour or two. And uh, I think you, you drew the same conclusion I did. Yeah, I think there are more, after I thought about it, I mean, I'm not a, a licensed contractor, but when uh, looking at it, as we talked about, when they go to pull that, that ceiling down, it's, it's going to collapse. Yeah, you know, once you take one panel out, you know, you have heavy lights there and stuff. That's why I said you probably ought not to have some volunteers doing that. But my thinking, John, I, I thought about this the other night, is that um, if if we take if they take down the ceiling, of course it's going to collapse. We know that, yeah. but they could actually take and uh, patch, like you suggested, the dry uh, the old drywall, yeah. and then just put the drop ceiling back in. And the reason that well, I thought I'm, about that, I'm not sure that that you're going to have to repair anything. You know, it, it could be that just the the Trauma working up there loosened up the supports that hold the ceiling. So can I ask, what's the role of council right now? Are we discussing a, a loan to the market authority who will determine what the steps are? Are we going to fix I, the problem right. ourselves? Well, we, we own the building. Um, we, right, we own, right, right, right. We own the building. Mm -hmm. So we, what, the reason John and I went down is because it is our building. We want to make sure when the repairs are done that they're, they're done. The, of course, the amount right, of right, so is pretty small. Yeah, and I didn't. I I wanted John to go sure. look because I didn't couldn't imagine that unless it was something very simple, it would cover it. It didn't seem like a lot of money to me, and uh, it wouldn't take much to spend that much money. It, well, my concern was if if, if they're going to do this and repair it, let's do it correctly. Um, so if you put the new drop ceiling back in, of course they have lighting, um, track lighting, track lighting in there. That you know, do we look at just putting well, LEDs in? In, and, uh, in our industry, this is called a might as well project <laughs> because yeah. once you get in there, you're going to have a whole, whole, you could potentially have a lot of issues. And you said, you know, should we do this? Might as well, you know, because, it, you know, when, once you dig in there, you're probably going to, you might get into more than you want, but you probably have, you can control that, you know, by doing what you need to do. I just don't know if 5,000 is going to cover the ticket if they do get into other, yeah. other issues. But I would, John and I were thinking is that, you know, it's a city building, we want to make sure it's properly done. Sure, sure. Um, well, first thing, you you know, there's a big section of suspended ceiling like this over the uh, copy machine and a computer and a desk, and, and it's been that way for several months and nobody's moved. You know, you know and the reason is that there's nobody there getting paid, it's all volunteers. You know, they're not going to hurt yourself moving big heavy desks and stuff, so uh, I'm not sure how you handle that. But. Are we getting rental income upstairs? We do not. The authority does. Yeah, the authority doesn't. It doesn't so, look like it's very much. But. 
Yeah. What was there? Um, so I think the proposal that had come to council was a five thousand dollar loan mm -hmm. from the market authority. Um, but we haven't heard anything from from them. I guess it just sounds like we're trying to figure out the scope of the project and if the city should take it over and make it something bigger. Well, I think, it, I think they, they were waiting for more money. I think they were waiting for a response from us. Yeah, I think they were waiting for a response to how deep do we want to get into it? You know, do we want to put a new whole new ceiling in? And this is only half of the upstairs. The the Haitian side does not seem to be damaged from what we've seen. And it's it's just contained to one area there. About even the hallway's clear. I yeah, mean, I mean the ceiling's it's not clear. Like about ten foot square in one room and and even smaller in the other room. So I guess what we're looking at from council is that making suggestions on, well, you know, if we're going to do this, we want to do it this way, and then get a contractor to come in and well, give them a bid on it. You, because of your probable exposure there, you don't want volunteers doing this. Right. You know, I mean, they, they do a lot of stuff there. And they didn't propose. They had gotten quotes from QRS for fuller construction, mm -hmm. fully confident as um, that Alice was seeking some support on what's the true scope of work. In my own experience, right, I've any electrician will tell you, no, that guy doesn't know what the hell he's doing, do it this way, and, and is looking for guidance on what is the proper scope of work. Um, and council has a whole bunch of questions, and then you appoint into subcommittee. Um, I would be glad, I mean, really, I, it appears that, as best I can tell, no one has removed the drop ceiling, and maybe if we just take the public works department down there, I get a crew in there, we rip out the drop ceiling, we look at what our damage is, and we can assess from there. Can you do that? We we own the building. I'm okay. sure we can. Uh, that would be my. I'll be I'll be glad to step back in and manage the project if the council wants. Uh, do you have time? Um, no, you I'm definitely trying to stay out of it, but I don't think that's a good idea at this point. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment. Fix it ourselves. Uh, the next council well, meeting, I think. Uh, <laughs> that was kind of what I thought. You could have done I didn't know if you. I do. Those, Thank you. I didn't know if those people were available to you then. Um, we could look for a good rainy day and we'll um, maybe I'll discuss that with council and the authority and and see if we if it doesn't make sense for our crews to go in to move equipment to move tables to move um, <coughs> coffee machines we could probably tear out the ceiling and then have a better assessment of what the damage is and then go from there yeah okay all right and can we connect with the Council on the Arts on that too? To um, the authority will have to because they're a tenant of the authority. So we'll communicate with the authority and they can coordinate. Sure. Thanks course. for taking that on. Thanks, Andy. Sure. <laughs> That's sorry, that, we're out of it. <laughs> sorry, sorry, that sounded short. <laughs> okay. I guess Thanks, that concludes me. <laughs> Thanks. See you, John. Thanks. Thanks. Great work. See you, John. <laughs> So we have boards, authorities, commission appointments. Do we? We don't have any. There's a there's a summary there in front of you. Then so. Um, so council's aware that we had reached out to folks interested in either being reappointed or um, continue to serve under the housing authority. Sonia Logan is an existing housing authority member, is willing and interested to be appointed to a new five-year term, and is supported by Bill Thomas, the executive director, and the remainder of the board. Um, then when you look at vacancies, uh, the market authority you actually filled tonight, right, right Katie? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Um, then um, Dan Foster, so yeah, there's two Meadbury Recreation Authority appointments now, seats, vacancies. Um, Dan Foster, city appointment, um, chose not to be reappointed, is that correct? Correct. Okay. We still have a letter of interest out on <coughs> rec authority as well from Ben Schlitz. Oh, that's right. Okay, yep. Um, then the zoning hearing board position you filled uh, with count, uh, former councilman Battaglia. Um, there's still then an alternate zoning hearing board, alternate position to fill. And then on the Shade Tree Commission, Kirsten Martin declined to be reappointed. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and just indicated to Katie that she wasn't available to continue to serve. So there's a vacancy on the Shade Tree Commission now. Okay. Planning Commission. And now there's a vacancy on the Planning Commission. Okay. We don't. Other than the one, we don't have any letter of interest. Well, you have Sonia Logan, who, right. who and then Ben Schlipf had sent a letter of interest, and um, we were reviewing whether he could be appointed because right. he's not a resident of the city, but he is a taxpayer. He lives in Edinburgh. Or, uh, Sager Town. Sager Town. There are two rec authority positions. Yes. Yep. Correct. Yep. Both city. 
Yeah, appointments yet only yet. I think we had two people express interest about a year ago, if I recall. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Um, Is it possible to reach back out to that's them? That's what I was wondering. Have, have, we have not reached back out yet, have we? No. I. There's lots of moving parts to appointments these days, and I don't. So we'll take direction. Well, we'll take direction from council. And what about putting Sonia back on the housing authority? Yeah. I don't have a problem doing that at uh, the recommendation of a bill. And do we have anybody that has a letter of interest to that? She had just communicated with Bill um, her interest in being reappointed, and he he then contacted me and informed me of her interest and his support of that. Mayor, do you want a motion? Um, yeah. I so move to reappoint Sonia Logan to the Housing Authority for a five-year term. Do I have a second? Second. second. Um, Which of you wants it? What's that? Yeah. Um, any comments? Any questions you guys have? Roll call. Yep. Oh, I just think similarly. I, you know, I, I don't know Sonia. I would want to see um, a letter of interest, even just interest to remain on the authority. I'm friends with Sonia. You know? Yeah. Her son's friends with my kids. I'm trying to think how Larry would know her because Larry has to know her. But I can't, I can't put it together yet. I can't think of the guy's name. Well, the future ones that we have in front of us, we can, I mean, there's no real rush to go to that, so when we start the process. Um, well, I'll just ask for a roll call. We have a second, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Donahue? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Froa? Aye. Vogel? No. Uh, Stearns? Aye. Okay. So the rest of these, we don't have any. Well, we have the two that applied a year ago, cannot, and then you have a third. I, I cannot one. remember their names. Um, I can picture them, but I can't. Reminds me, I wasn't here. It was Taylor Hinton and Shana Morrison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So should we reach back out since they had an interest then to see if they have an interest now? Or do you want to wait till we have the process ready? And we don't know if we're going to adopt the process. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of... Reach out to them. I just saw Shana recently. I don't know if she's interested anymore, but... Yeah, I'm not sure she is or not, because we didn't get back to her. What's the pleasure of council, majority of council? I don't think it would hurt to reach out. I mean... Yeah, I think, I think that we reach back out. Um, maybe we treat the appointments between now and, you know, at, as we're working through an appointment process, if we choose to, to do that and forward with it, with it, I think we treat appointments between now and its potential adoption as we have yep. in, in the past, okay. um, just to fill the seats. We made right. an appointment today. I would not want to hold off on other appointments. Okay. If we already made Okay. So we'll just from the, from this point forward, we'll just take each individual. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, the one thing we want to make sure is, you know, these are all volunteer positions. They're not paid for doing this. Mm -hmm. And if somebody does have an interest, um, my thought was always, what, what's that authority looking at? Because they're the ones who have to work with them. So we always try to. We have no set rules. We know that. But we always tried to get their input because they're the ones who had to work with them. Um, but why don't we reach back out to these two, ask them if they're interested, if they are. We can ask them to, to do a letter of resume of interest. That way you have a little bit more background of what they're looking for. Um, that, mm -hmm. Would that be fair? I think so. I was under the impression that both had, had uh, supplied it, so we might be able to... Dig through our work. I don't know if we would still have it, but We'd have to they might be able to resubmit. Yeah. But why don't we send a letter and ask if they have an interest? Because they may not have an interest any longer. But let's see if they have an interest, and if they do, then we'll pull the, the resume up, or if they want to send a new one, they can. And the third one that you have that has expressed an interest? I think we're still working on that one because we okay. don't. When we make an appointment, I mean, I understand people pay, you know, you know their, their tax here, but I'd like people that has to, that they're living in Mayville, that, that see the 
what is happening. If you have somebody living in Segertown, they're, just because you pay here doesn't mean that you have the interest. So I, I really like, personally, my thinking is, let's keep the people local to, to the, be appointed. Okay, because then the question comes out, if you have somebody paying taxes living in the city of Erie, you know, and they want to be on an authority, um, are they going to be here? Do they understand what's happening in the city of Meadville? Meadville is a whole lot different than the city of Erie. So. Yeah, I've always thought the opposite of then what Leroy thought, but as a, over the years, I've realized that he's probably right in this case because I've watched people. I'm going to write that, that down. Yes. <laughs> I'm okay. Write that down. But uh, in, over the years, I've noticed that the people that are local that you really are you see all the time are the ones who are more interested. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, so let's see, I already did that one. Okay, uh, B, uh, discussion volunteer appointments, policy and procedures. We can just talk a little bit about it. So, Autumn, I'm going to have you take off with that one, that's right. Sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, as I think has become kind of evident to, tonight, there's not really a standard for um, you know, a means by which to appoint new folks to uh, the city's authorities, boards, and commission. Um, and commissions, uh, there is, uh, you know, kind of a interest out there um, for folks to, to serve. Um, what we've heard from community residents is that it's hard to know when things come open. It's hard to know what to submit. It's hard to, um, there, there's just a lot that's, that's missing um, without a standard process. Um, Especially when it comes to you know uh, letting folks know exactly what the process is, what the openings are, when they're coming open, how to go about um, uh, applying, <coughs> and I and I think that a standard process makes it easier for people to get involved, which I think is is really important and is uh, critical to the role that we play here on council. Um, and it also it also helps council to you know be able to say we vetted you know all of these applicants. Um, you know, the, the authorities have, have seen the applicants and, and have made their recommendations, um, and it maybe gives us uh, some more legs to stand on when we make appointments. Um, so I shared with council, well, I shared with Andy, who shared with council, thanks, Andy, um, uh, a draft of a policy um, that was crafted with city residents um, who are particularly interested in this, um, in this issue. Uh, it kind of stipulates two appointment cycles. So kind of, uh, you know, as we see here tonight, right, we've got several uh, vacancies um, and it would kind of lump that all together. They'd all be advertised together. Um, uh, kind of the vetting process would happen all at the same time and we would vote um, on those in two cycles throughout the year. So a spring cycle and a fall cycle. Um, it stipulates um, kind of, uh, the ways in which we get the information out to people so that people know about the vacancies through the city's website, on uh, the city's social media accounts, and the Meville Tribune, um, and potentially through a listserv, but that's a whole other thing that we'd have to work uh, through with city staff. Um, and it lays out exactly what would be needed in, in an application. Um, it lays out two, um, some requirements of, of uh, board authority commission members to, to continue um, and who would be eligible for, for reappointment, um, folks who meet um, attendance requirements and, and are contributing to the, um, to kind of the good work of their authority. Um, uh, it's a standard, what's being proposed is like a standard application, so folks just fill that out. So rather than uh, a letter of interest that is one sentence long or a letter of interest that's five pages long, um, and Katie doesn't have to read five pages of a letter of interest, uh, it's, it's a standard application that everyone would fill out. Um, the the vision for kind of the, the rollout of, of this, this is a draft that, that's being presented right now to council. Um, over the next month, uh, myself and some of the uh, residents who have volunteered to, to kind of work on this um, are interested in bringing this to the city's authorities, boards, and commissions um, and asking for kind of structured feedback, so giving a structure for uh, those entities to weigh in on this drafted policy um, to review with city staff to ensure that kind of what's in here 
um, and, and what would be expected of city staff is, is a doable thing, that we've got the capacity to do it, that it's something we can manage um, in, in the time that we're looking at and maybe make adjustments where we have to to kind of um, make sure that we're not throwing too much at um, already strapped staff. Um, and then to bring it back to council, we're looking at uh, within the month, so we're looking at the third Wednesday of February um, to, to kind of do all this and, and have a more formalized draft that we'd be ready to vote on with council at that time. Um, How many is in the group that you have? I'm just curious. Um, there were, uh, so this was introduced to a large group at a, um, a, a public event that we had in October. It was a pizza party and policy workshop, um, and there were about uh, 10 people at the table then, and an additional, um, uh, maybe an additional five or so folks have had hands on it, so um, just under 20 people have, have kind of helped to, to craft and review the document. All residents of the city of Utah. That was my next question. A diverse group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my next question if they were residents of the city. Um, so we have this in front of us. So this committee then would go to our authorities then um, to, to talk with them about the process. Is that what you're um, yes, yeah, the, co the committee could go. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in going um, um, and kind of introducing myself to the authorities, board, and commission in the role of a council member, um, making it known that, you know, I will be wanting their input on things moving forward. And for example, here's, um, you know, kind of a piece of policy that we want some structured feedback on. Um, but yes, the, the idea is that it would go. Um, to in person to as many as possible, um, but certainly uh, digitally to everyone. We can't make it. Everyone being the city's board authorities and commission. Do, do we advertise this in the Tribune now? What's up? Anything. It says you have to advertise, be publicized. On a, within a 60 day period, vacancies shall be publicized on the city's website twice in the Meadville Tribune. Do we? Do no, that? there's no there's no legal advertising in the Tribune for certain. Anymore. Okay, so we wouldn't have to, we could just tell them and have it put in. No, we don't tell the Tribune what to print. Well, um, but you could <laughs> send them a, You could send they will, them. They will print what we pay to print, but. Um, <laughs> They have on occasion as a partner to the city and a member of upstanding member of this community have mentioned in the past that they're seeking um, appointment or you know volunteers. Because okay, Linesville um, has one right now. They have an opening and it's been in the Tribune and it's not print. It's not uh, a binding one. It's they've just been having a printing there. Okay. Yeah, we can do, you can do a display. Is this is going to be a cost that. to the city or not? Right, and that could be a conversation that we have too, right? If we're looking at just two cycles, it's, it would just happen, you know, at those two points in the year. It would happen twice, right, in the uh, spring cycle and twice in the fall. Um, it's, it's, I think, a reasonable request, so uh, that, that could be part of the conversations we have to see what it would cost the city. Um, and if we could uh, get it down, then So, I, I guess I got a question for Gary that just came up in my mind, if you don't mind. So, Gary, when we have the authorities, they have their bylaws and everything that they've got to follow through with, correct? Correct. They're all independent entities. Yeah. Okay. So we, when it says the 60 days, I'm, I'm assuming that's when their term ends, correct? Uh, yes, of upcoming. Sure, sure. I just want to make sure that we don't be, we're not stepping on somebody's bylaws. You see what I'm, and I may not have to worry about that, but it's, it's a question that I've come up. We have to be careful that we don't step on their bylaws because they are their own authorities. Mm -hmm. So, so for the 60 days, that would be our policy, not their policy. So they could wait. They don't have to follow this, in other words. This is a policy of council, of a proposed policy of council of how you would I'm fill just vacancies. Any issue. Yes. So these are proposed rules, as I understand it, of how you you all will act together on making the appointments. On appointments. Yes. Okay. So it's not required of them to come to us within that sixty days. That's our policy. To notify you of a vacancy, right. I I think as part of this work you're going to be asking them to cooperate and let you know when there's a vacancy. 
so you can follow your policy of how you fill their board. Okay. I'm just trying to think of any of the... Uh, I had a lot of... Uh, like these boards and authorities, the authority, like the water authority, is like very powerful. And I mean, they can control our water rates and it's like a tax to us. And we can change how much people want, money people have to buy pizza or whatever they do with their money. But the market authority has to come to us to fix the ceiling. That's because it's our building. But yeah, right. right. So, I mean, that's not really, in my mind, that's not really comparable at all. And the other thing is, is there's nothing in here about council members. And since I've been on council, we appointed a council member. And that was something I thought should be included in something like this. And the other, I have, the thing I've had the most questions about the whole time I've been here is like six years. And actually, me and Leroy probably have appointed everybody. Everybody's been appointed. We, and I'm sure we voted yes, because I don't think I've ever heard a no. Until tonight. The way we've done it in the past, if again, you know, if one of us knew someone was either by recommendation or we would actually, well, you and John, I believe, actually sat down and interviewed that was, the water. I wanted to talk about that too, because that was such a uh, important thing at the time. Right. Uh, where was I at on this? Oh, the only thing the people have always asked me about is nepotism. They they think that because someone's related, they shouldn't be on a board or that they shouldn't be on the authority. And that's something that should be included is are you related to somebody that works for the that's city? The question. Are you, do you know, I mean, that would be, are you married to them? I mean, it's related somehow. That should be something, because that's something that people ask me. And uh, the, when we did the uh, water authority, that was a, a rather large deal because the fluoride and we met with Tim Groves, who was the man, the and the attorney from the Water Authority, and we interviewed. I think it was like nine people. And my I, my personal agenda was I don't know what John's and anybody's was, and actually Gil Day was our pick, and he knew the most about water. He really did know what he was talking about, and he had no bearing on the fluoride issue. And most of the people were there either for it or against it, and that was their whole agenda. And I was personally looking for someone who really hadn't had a predetermined notion when they sat down. But other than that, that's the only thing I've ever seen where we had more than our share of seats. I mean, I mean, and uh, something else that was on here that it says two council members and three board members of each board would interview. And it says at least three applicants, and I just don't, I mean, I don't think you're going to get three applicants for every one of these. I mean, I, a lot of times we'll take whoever they get because it is a volunteer position and they don't get paid. I mean, that was just something that bothered me, and then it's hard to, to get two members of council and three board members to meet with a, someone, that's six people that have to all stop whatever they're doing to make arrangements to go talk be on the beautification, the shade tree commission. I mean, I just don't see that as something I see as viable. When I'm, does Joe Galbo on the shade tree commission? He's probably on. It. He's yes. on something. Yeah, he's on the shade tree. Yes. And, uh, I mean, I, I just I know Joe, and I would, you know, so, someone like him, I would never think Joe would have to go and interview him because he's a fixture in the community. And I just these are things that I have problems with with this. Uh, and then the other thing is, is I had this at home. Maybe you can update it. I can't see it, but. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, city of Meadville union contracts, and it says appointment list for city boards and authorities, and then city employees. And it's from 2013. So maybe we can update these. Sure. And, I'll uh, pass it to me. I'll and, overdo it. That note. And, uh, I don't even know how this. No, I don't know where I got that, but I knew I had it. Well, I think this is a process that you were kind of hoping for that we'd be able to discuss it. Yeah, and, yeah. So tonight, this is a discussion. Nothing, discussion, none yeah. of this is set in stone. So okay. if we want to uh, change the, because I've always thought it was too, mm -hmm. it wasn't out and open enough, mm -hmm. and I thought it just happened too quickly. But then another thing that I don't know, I've always, like, I I like the fact that we we'll all vote yes. Because I think that 
our support is important to someone that's sitting on the water authority who is making, like I said, making a determination that other people aren't going to have as much money in their pocket when the when their paycheck comes. And I just think it's important that we support them or appear to. I don't know whether if you do or not. And and uh, I mean I don't always agree with everything they say and do, like especially the water authority and the fluoride action. But I would never disagree publicly about it because they're underneath us and we put them there and I don't want them to think I don't support them. Well, I think what one of the things I, what I'm coming out with this is that we really don't have a set procedure on how we're doing it. Um, there was an, a, um, an appointment that I was looking at and I applied for the appointment and I actually had to fill out a application and give a resume. And, and when, you, when you go through that process, you know, when you're giving that information, that then then the authority or that board has that information in front of them. You know, would he be good at doing this? Would he be good at doing that? Um, the one thing I just want to be careful of is we're a small community. Um, in the past, it's been very difficult at times to fill these positions. We've gone many times not even reappointing; they just continue on and on and on. Um, so we have. To, I think we need to be gentle with that. Um, because these are volunteers. I mean, they're not getting paid for it. So when they do put the application in or, or a resume, I, I'm, I'm more looking at a resume. That way I, I can see where their, their strengths are. Because you, you'd like to have people put in where their strengths are. You know, um, so I, I'd like to see that in the application. You know, what, where their thoughts were, what can they do to better or uh, new ideas. So. I don't mind seeing the resume. Uh, matter of fact, I, 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 I think that might be something that I'd like to see continue with it, the resume. Um, I just want to make sure, too, that we don't step on the authority's toes when it comes to their bylaws and stuff like that, which I don't think we will, but I just wanted to point that out. Mayor, I have some concerns. This policy is unnecessarily complex. Um, it involves more cost advertising, something we need to go advocates council's uh, responsibility having someone like my need bill uh, create lists serve that's not a function of anybody but the city staff itself and elected officials um, the cycles are long and complex it would take months to get someone through a, a cycle for an appointment uh, and probably worst of all where the, uh, a provision where the number of consecutive terms is not stipulated, members may serve two consecutive terms. We tried that 25 years ago, and it was a disaster because it is very difficult to get some good, qualified people who have the breadth and depth of experience necessary. And time, time, time. And, and time. I mean, you've got to dedicate a lot of time. Some of these authorities are a lot of very busy. I know people who serve 20 or 25 years on authorities and I hope they can serve another 25 years because they do a good job. So to put any kind of a limitation here uh, is counterproductive to the goals of the city. Okay, all right, so I'm hearing concerns. I respect them. Um, so this is, yeah, so this is a draft. All of this is stuff we can work through. I, I will just speak to a few of the points that I'm hearing. Um, Again, the length of, of cycles is, is kind of uh, determined so that there aren't, um, uh, I think, four cycles in a year or, or anything more than two actually becomes maybe more burdensome for, uh, for city staff. But I'm, but I'm hearing you that maybe the length of cycles is complicated. Um, I think the provisions for my MIVA to handle some of the, um, like the listserv, and I think it was the open, um, I think it was the open house, um, was really just built in in the event that it was a, a lot to ask of staff, which, you know, I think at this point it's, you know, uh, we, we haven't necessarily heard from staff about it if it's too much, but the idea there was that there would be an opportunity for volunteers to do something that um, there, there's potential for volunteers to, to do um, and to lift that burden. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm hearing that concern, uh, and that's something that maybe we can bring up when we when we do meet <coughs> with staff. Um, 
and I'm hearing the concern around the two consecutive term provisions. Um, and it kind of ties into to a theme of folks, uh, the idea that we don't maybe have enough folks interested to, to fill the, the, the seats. Um, and I, yes, so I, so I hear these. I will say that this is, this is again, this was crafted by um, volunteers, and this is not the exciting part either. This isn't even serving on anything. This is just structuring how we appoint people who will serve. So uh, I think the fact that, you know, folks were willing to do this is, is a testament to people's um, interest to, to get started um, and, and to serve on city boards authorities. I, I also, I would wonder, too, if there's, you know what what it could look like I, I guess it would be uh, uh, but but I wonder if, if things like this can happen in a trial period right can we try a, a policy um, and 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 see right if we're getting interest and right if we're if we're not then we amend the policy um, you know the can policy is an ordinance things? it's just a, a policy things? Uh, sure. I think that what we're, this, these are things I have noticed, okay? Uh, we've got to get the word out better that there's openings in these authorities and boards. And there's got to be a way to do that, okay? I, because I, people will say, oh, I've been on that. I didn't know it was open. And I, well, you should have asked me, but geez, you have to find me and ask me, you know, that's silly. Uh, that's something that bothers me. Uh, as far as, the, I, when people do send in a letter, we should read it. They all should be read. I, I, and they, they might not have been read. It might have been an oversight in the past, but I know there's been a few people that have told me, and I've seen their letters, and I knew they weren't read. Now, the thing is, is they could be read on our Wednesday meeting that isn't televised, and you'd have to go on to our website to read our minutes to know that it was read, which I don't know if people do. I don't do it. But, I mean, people might go in and read those minutes to see if their letters were read. That's something that, I think... What you're talking about could have happened, and I'm not saying in the past, yes. because what we've done when I became mayor is any communication I get, not only do you get it like I sent John's to all of you, you should have all received it, but I also make sure it goes to staff. Well, I can think so, of a, but, but, a specific person who applies for everything, and if everybody thinks about it, they'll know, and uh, I have never heard his name read in his letters. But So I know that that's somebody, I'll tell you later. Uh, and then the other thing was, as far as like providing a resume, I, I like someone like John. John was on the sewer authority, he was on the school board. He doesn't. He was school teacher. He was on city council. He doesn't have to provide me a resume to tell me, you know, to prove to me that now this woman that just we just approved that I just was impressed with her letter. I mean, PhD. I mean, uh, she doesn't have to provide me a, a resume either. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think as far as legitimacy and to keep everything on an even keel, you're either going to do it one way, you're not going to, I don't think it's right to say, well, that person doesn't have to provide a resume, this person does. If you're going to do something, do it evenly across board, that way there's no, you, no one can say what. Well, I was given, or that person was given special consideration. Everybody's held accountable to, to provide the same information. As far as his policy, you just gave a book to Andy that had a, a from 2013, had a, maybe we should step back, take a look at that, see what it offers, and in conjunction with what she's, uh, with the proposal that, that she has, I'm quite sure that we could come up with something, because we all do agree that we need, we need a policy an appointment procedure in hand. We need, you know, we but to sit here going back and forth, back and forth with stories over and over again, it's not accomplishing anything. Okay, we do agree that we need one. Um, I, I think we do. Um, like I said, there's the there's the one that you gave from 2013. Let's look at it. Let's just the lists. That that's a list. But let's look. Let's sit down and, and put our our heads together instead of back and forth about who or, or what. Um, everybody's got good points and good ideas, but we, we, the main thing is we want to find out how we can come together and get these positions open to the public, out to the public, okay, um, and go from there. We'll deal with the problems that come up later, somebody not, not getting anybody interested. We'll deal with that later. But now what we need to do is sit down and figure out what type of policy and procedures we're going to come up with. These aren't published on our website, are they not? Andy? What are the vacancies? 
Um, but the, the actual appointments are the, the members of the board. I don't, we don't advertise when there's a vacancy. Right. So um, I guess would the rest of council, council be amenable to, um, if, if I was to continue working with folks and, and if anyone wants to be part of this, this process, they're welcome to, um, to, to uh, simplify it make, it, make it less complex. Um, and part of that process, I think, might be talking with, with staff to see maybe just what's not doable, and that might just eliminate pieces altogether, um, but simplify it and then circulate a, a, another. Yeah, draft. I think one thing um, that I'd like to see is that council sees these policies. Uh, in other words, we don't send a group of people into our, our thought or authorities with this information without council saying it because they're not really representing council. They're not an authority of council. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, you know, when, when you were talking about the, the group going and talking to the authority. Yeah, I think after tonight's discussion, I'm not going to do that. So I think that instead, I would probably, that's so that's why we can simplify. Um, I, I think part of that conversation, though, has to, I think part of that simplification has to be with staff to see what's, right. what's doable. Okay. So just take it to, to staff simplify and then share a draft with with okay. council yeah, and that's prior to I, I we wouldn't take to authorities until we were you know some kind of consensus i would imagine okay any other comments or questions that's enough for tonight on that <laughs> okay um Thank you. And thank we you. We have something in place to replace the city manager, don't we? Please thank them. For Three votes. Time. Three <laughs> votes. <laughs> oh. What's that? Three votes, we're out. Oh. What's this? Sean asked if there's a policy to replace the city manager, and I said it's three votes. Three votes. Uh, I don't see that happening. It would probably require much less debate. <laughs> uh. You just got to give yourself a job. I mean, you know, you got a big going on. All right, so where are we at? So is there, for staff's perspective, uh, clarification, that we're going to, uh, on, we'll go back and uh, prepare a more refined draft, simplified draft, or something for a circulation and review of council and continued discussion? Yes, and I'll be in contact with you and Katie about um, reviewing it to see what um, you all feel capable of doing. Sure. Okay. Uh, Discussion city council meet and greet with the city staff. So I'm going to head that off kind of because Autumn brought this up about meeting with the, uh, the staff. And um, in the past, what we have done, of course, council members will get a tour of the city. Uh, is that still going to be taking place, Andy? Uh, I, I serve at your pleasure. In my notes, I had re suggested, let me find them. While well, you're finding those, I found it interesting and, and helpful when I first got on council. It was around the two council meetings. Around two council meetings. So at next month, right on February 5th and the 19th. And Autumn, you might be out of town on the 5th. I am out of town. Okay. The fifth, I recalled that after I had circulated that. Okay. Um, but anyhow, I had proposed taking a normal meeting schedule, which means it probably doesn't matter. And we would meet at, say, at 4 30 prior to the 6 p.m. meeting. We could do a tour of this building and the fire station, one, meet, one session, and we could do then a tour at a different time of the public works garage and the sewer authority. And that's for any council member that wants to to, to go? Yes, right. It would okay. be it would be for council specifically that department heads would be available and would provide a tour of um, their respective facility. Um, I thought those were the primary facilities, the police station, the fire station, public works garage, and the sewer authority. Yeah, I found the sewer authority to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's the only one I've never seen, but I don't yeah. know that I want to go. Uh, oh, Andy, when we do that, uh, um, we're going to have to do it after 5 o'clock. Okay. I ought to mention the old city building. That would be, yes, we should put that on there. Thank you. Yeah. And the water authority. There's lots to see there, but yeah, well, the grounds, though, are actually important, and the equipment. Yeah, that would be fine. Yep. Is that the type of meet and greet that you wanted to, to do? Um, or did you want to meet? Um, I think that it is different, but I think that it is sufficient for tonight. I, I don't think we have to discuss a meet and greet. Okay. You can deal with that. But maybe after we do it after. Okay. Uh, decision, City Council. Well, well let's go back to that. Um, go ahead. So just so <laughs> are, are, am I to schedule these tours consistent with meetings after 5 p.m. on a meeting day? 
yeah. for council. That works for you. Mm -hmm. Does that work for you? Uh, yes, I'll be out of town for the February 5th meeting, but if it's this building and um, yeah, the, the, the fire. Uh, and we can arrange certainly for a separate tour. Okay. okay. So we got that okay? Are we allowed to move on? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Are we, are we all right? I'm all right. All right. <coughs> Discussion City Council goals setting a retreat. Um, I thought it might be really good, especially when you always have <coughs> council members. Um, and, and we do have some, some things that we really have to look at for the future of the city um, that we would set a, uh, a date that we can sit down, we can do it in an open session. I think it would be good the public sees what we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. and, um, and some of the goals that, you know, things that we have to, to really take a look at. And I'm talking budget-wise because I, I'm very concerned about the budget for the next two years or three years. Um, so I thought we could do that. That way we can kind of each see where our ideas are, where our thoughts are, um, where we're all heading. Because you're, it'd be much easier if we understood where we were, each other and what we were looking at. So I don't know if you want to do that in an evening. Um, I mean, we're not going to Florida and sitting on the beach, but, um, or a Saturday, I'm not sure you know, what, what schedule. And, and really, how long do we want it? You know, um, Can you I'm thinking it? maybe three hours by the time we can sit down and discuss the, some of the, the process. And of course, the media would be involved. I need also. food. If it's three hours, I need food. Okay. <laughs> pizza. pizza. Oh, no. Oh. You don't like pizza? <laughs> you don't like pizza? Mother Roy, we might need a little more time than three hours. You think? I think so. Council did this again a half a century ago, and they took uh, an entire weekend. Okay. Food will decide then. I think if it's longer than three, a Saturday. Yeah. Saturday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys have any special dates? I'm going to look at mine. It's going to be for the budget. Well, it's going to be for because I mean, before you know it, we'll be back in budget session. Well, I'm going to tell you, my my goals. I hope with councils is to start on the budget. Okay, that's now. my goal too. So, um, do we have? Um, a sense of uh, the financial financial management plan when the that would be completed. Stamp. <laughs> yeah. So specifically in the scope of work, we've we've tried to put a fairly aggressive schedule. There would be some preliminary recommendations that would be useful in the next budget session. Um, but by the we don't control how long it takes to get a DCD contract, though they've awarded it. They could take three more months administratively, get a contract council authorized signature, send it back before we would then ink the contract with a consultant and get started. So there's some gray areas. We could potentially have emergency or in priority. Uh, yeah, priority emergency recommendations by maybe September, October ish time frame. Best case. If we're lucky. Okay. Great. So there's no reason to wait. We wouldn't wait for any of that. No, it wouldn't impact this budget. Okay. How's February 8th look for everyone? <laughs> That's pretty that would be Gary's birthday and the day before okay. my birthday. That's your so. birthday? Cake. Yeah. It is. I expect right. cake though. <laughs> also, uh, I am enrolled in a newly elected officials course that does meet on Saturdays in Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. That's one of our meeting dates. Uh, 15th? Oh, why don't we... I, I don't have a calendar with me, and I have no idea what I'm doing. So, figure out what you do if there's like a basketball game or something that I can't miss. I, you know, Can go to the basketball game. <coughs> Can we schedule outside of here and publicize the... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Okay. Mayor, I'm thinking March would be probably better. Okay. Okay, uh, any other questions on that? No? Okay. 
Um, motion to exonerate the city treasurer for collection of unpaid 2019 for capital tax. Do you want to read Michelle's uh, just so as if it was a resolution date? <laughs> Um, I am Michelle Sampson, city treasurer, being duly sworn according to law, say that the annexed paper is a record of taxes which remain unpaid on the city per capita tax duplicates for the year of 2019, and that I have made a diligent effort to collect such taxes. The 2019 per capita taxes that remain unpaid have been turned over to Sharp Collection Agency, Sharpsville, Pennsylvania, for collection on or about January 8th, 2020. Motion, please. Make the motion. Second. All second. Discussion. Michelle's not here, but I believe we're required to do this. You are. So pursuant to the third class city code, it's her job to attempt to collect the taxes for the tax year. This allows the city uh, and her to be released in so far as now we're going to turn it over to collections. We we get that money uh, eventually uh, because they diligently chase it but this uh, allows us to turn it over to collection. Right. Council, just uh, you've got the report in your packet. This represents, I don't know how many number of accounts, but uh, just shy of $20,000 at face value with penalty nearly $21,000 of delinquent per capita tax revenue. And this council is aware that we remark each time once sharp, this is, this is my due to the city, sharp collection, who is a third party collection agency, collects a fee and it will be a much steeper price. Um, Somewhere around a hundred dollars. Yes. Any other discussion? Roll call. Donahue? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Rowa? Aye. Vogel? Aye. Starnes? Aye. Um, Motion to exonerate the city treasurer for collection of unpaid 2019 real estate tax. I am Michelle Sampson, city treasurer, being duly sworn according to law, say that the annexed paper is a record of taxes which remain unpaid on the real estate tax duplicates for the year 2019, and that I have made a diligent effort to collect such taxes. The 2019 real estate taxes that remain unpaid have been returned to the county treasurer's office at the Crawford County Courthouse for collection on January 7th, 2020. Any questions? Roll call. I didn't get a motion. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Uh, Donahue? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Roa? Aye. Vogel? Aye. And Stearns? Aye. Your Honor, I'll just note for the record um, that this, again, total value of delinquent real estate taxes uh, at face $250,000 with penalty an additional twenty-five, dollars so $275,000 in delinquent real estate tax revenue. Okay. Thank you. Each year it's about the same. Okay. That, that it covers our budget. <laughs> it's not extra. <laughs> I wish it was extra, but it's not. Um, resolution to authorizing signatures for the Meadville Area Recreation Authority note and security agreement for the locker room roof replacement project. Resolved by the Council of the City of Meadville that whereas pursuant to resolution number 46 of 2015, the City of Meadville authorized the lending of $50,000 of which a principal balance of $30,891 remains for the Meadville Area Recreation Authority to cover the capital repairs associated with replacing the pool liner at the Meadville Area Recreation Complex. <coughs> And whereas Mara has determined that further capital repairs to the mark are necessary, specifically repairs to the roof above the locker rooms, which are costly and jeopardize the mark's operational finances. And whereas the city of Meadville has determined that the mark is a vital community asset that serves the public's health and welfare, and is an asset the city desires to support. And whereas upon the request of Mara, the city of Meadville has determined that it is in the city's best interest to fund an additional $70,000 capital need, set amount to be combined with the remaining principal balance of $30,891, for a total loan balance of $100,891, and to be evidenced by a promissory note to be secured by a lien on the Mara business equipment and physical assets. 
Now therefore be it resolved that the Council of the City of Meadville authorizes the lending of $100,891 to the Meadville Area Recreation Authority for the specific purpose of repairing the roof above the locker room and to include the remaining balance of the prior pool liner project subject to the approval and signatures of the Meadville Area Recreation Authority and to be pursuant to the attached note, security agreement, and related loan documents. Be it further resolved that the mayor, controller, and the city clerk are hereby authorized and directed to execute and to attest such copies of the attached security agreement in the manner required by law as may be reasonably required for the purposes of the parties thereto. Motion, please. I make a motion and accept. Second. Second. Thank you. Discussion. Andy. Um, most of the details are in there. Kind of, we've discussed this at some length on prior meetings uh, at the end of last year. Um, as the resolution notes, this is essentially modifying a prior note um, for the pool liner project that was $50,000 made back in whatever year Katie said, 2015. Um, and so that's the remaining balance of that is approximately $30,000, $31,000. This adds approximately $70,000 to that for the um, pool roof replacement, I'm sorry, the locker room <coughs> roof replacement project for a combined total of nearly $100,000. Structured as a 20-year um, amortization schedule, right? Correct. Yes. Um, note and bearing interest of two percent. Two percent. Two payments a year. That's slightly higher than before, is it not? <coughs> we had rec We had earlier talked about one one, one and a half. half. One and a half. Yes. Good. And Debbie, you've worked with them. You feel confident that the tomorrow can make the payments. Uh, yes, in lieu of if they don't, you can keep $125,000. Okay. Well, I, I've always had a question about this. Now, if the rec complex, if they never made those payments, are we in, on the line for those payments? Well, the payments are too odd, so it's I'm not sure. a, No, but I mean if they didn't pay the... the uh, oh, the contractor for yes. instance? Or? Yes, exactly. No. We're not on line to them? No. Okay, so they're a separate entity from us. Correct. Okay. Okay, now your discussion. Roll call. Donahue? Aye. McKnight? Aye. Roa? Aye. Vogel? Aye. Stearns? Aye. Uh, resolution recognizing Sergeant Travis Pearson on his retirement. Be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Meadville that whereas Sergeant Travis Pearson has served as a valued employee of the City of Meadville Police Department for 25 years, and whereas Sergeant Pearson began working for the City of Meadville Police Department as a patrolman on January 1st, 1995, and whereas Sergeant Pearson was promoted to the position of Sergeant and began serving in that capacity on April 17, 2012, and whereas Sergeant Pearson has performed all the duties of his office with dedication, thoughtfulness, professionalism, and efficiency, and whereas Sergeant Pearson has elected to retire from active employment with the City of Meadville, effective January 5th, 2020. Now therefore be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Meadville that City of Meadville Police Sergeant Travis Pearson is hereby commended for his many years of dedicated service to this community and its citizens. Be it further resolved by the City Council of the City of Meadville that the best wishes of the city are extended to Sergeant Pearson for every success in the future. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Second. Um, we want to thank him for as many years. I, I, I can't believe it's he's retiring. It seems like it's just yesterday that he come on board. And, and uh, but I wish him um, the best in his retirement. I hope he enjoys it. And uh, look, it takes a couple months for him to get used to it. It's kind of fun after a while. And, also, Jim, any comments? Uh, a couple of comments. Um, for the record, I've had a lot of people call and extend kudos to the streets department for the excellent job they've done on removing snow. Uh, I'd also like to express on behalf of council uh, our sympathies on the passing of a recent uh, public works employee who was on loan to the uh, sewer department. He retired when about August. Uh, Jeff would have retired in May and, um, and then passed right at the end of the year. Yes. Uh, that's all, Your Honor. Um, I'm not sure if you ever met Travis. Great guy to work with. But, uh, Sean, any comments on his retirement? Uh, I'm sure that I met him. I can't picture which one he is. But, uh, 
<laughs> Good for him to have an early retirement, I guess. Larry, any comments? No, just it's very exciting. Um, looking forward to continue working um, together and helping resolve some of these issues. I'm looking forward to learning a lot. Um, and again, toward a just, I just thank the pe people that I'm, I'm able to be here. Um, I thank everyone for the support. Debbie, I've, I've come in a few times. She's gotten everything right together for me. Um, I've come to the front desk um, green, not knowing what I'm doing. Um, and it doesn't feel that way. Um, and I, I just want to thank everybody. Um, and I hope that this all that continues, that we can all work together and support each other. Um, so I think we have a lot, and we can do a lot together. It's late, we're all confused, but thanks to Sergeant Pearson <laughs> for his service. Um, yeah, we got kind of, we got kind of lost track, but can we go and have a roll call so we can make it official? Sure. Donahue. Aye. McKnight. Aye. Roa. Aye. Vogel. Aye. Stearns. Aye. We'll hop, uh, hop to uh, council member statements. Autumn, I'll start with you. <laughs> sure. No, no, it's okay. Uh, I, I, I'm thanks everyone for sticking it out. It was a late one. Um, uh, I will be calling in next time. Uh, I have a work obligation out of town, but um, we're making arrangements for that. So just it's a matter of great public interest. Uh, and I, I'll uh, reiterate to uh, the town hall on on Wednesday, the 22nd, that Andy mentioned um, for. Council and the public to win on the summer parks program, and thanks for the public to being here and being here so late. Thanks. Jim, I'll hop back to you. Do you have any other? All right, man. All right, man. All right, man. Sean, uh, this Saturday at the Academy Theater is my cousin Tammy Pescatelli. Uh, her mother's my first cousin. Who came in my life, of course. I think I was the reason she came back to me, Bill. She came to my wedding. And it was when she was just starting the uh, comedian stuff, and she didn't have a lot to do, and she hung out here when I was actually stayed in my room when I was on my honeymoon and liked Meatville. And, uh, but anyhow, that's this Saturday. I don't know if there's any more tickets. So I bought mine this week. And uh, Monday is the MLK, the Martin Luther King dinner. Uh, it's at St. Bridget's, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a really nice event. If you've never been there, I strongly suggest to find some time. I think it's at 6 o'clock, and I'm sure that they'll accommodate you if you call still. That's all. Okay. Just want to thank everybody for being here. Um, we got a lot accomplished this evening. And uh, with that, I think we're going to go into an executive session. For real estate, Your Honor, and for consultation with legal counsel. Okay. With that, I have a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Second. Roll call. Donahue. Aye. McKnight. Aye. Roa. Aye. Vogel. Aye. Stearns. Aye. Um, if you have your cell phones, please turn them back on so you can receive phone calls.